everyone, and welcome to the new webinar, Get Ready to Repair ADOS Equipped Vehicles. I'm Shannon Brandyberry, Special Projects Editor for MotorAge, and I will be your moderator today. By now, you very likely have heard the term ADOS, and there's a good chance either you or others in your shop have serviced vehicles featuring these advanced driver assistance systems. ADOS really is something the automotive industry created to combine into one category, the growing amount of technology on a vehicle designed to help drivers stay safe on the road and to encompass what is still to come in the promise of the autonomous vehicle. Which brings us back to why we're all here. We need to know how to service these systems, ways to do so in a timely fashion, and to complete the repairs with specific attention to detail. It comes down to millimeters. If a camera is off by even just one millimeter, it can make a difference of 40 feet ahead in some cases. Ben Johnson, Director of Product Management with Mitchell One, is our expert guest today. Having led a spirited lesson in ADOS technology and service at Apex, he is well versed in sharing why you need to be ready to service these vehicles, how to get information that you know is correct, and most importantly, put it all together for an accurate repair. Ben has extensive experience in his 35 years in the aftermarket, starting as a technician and culminating in his role now with Mitchell One. Ben, thanks for your time today. Well, Shannon, thanks for inviting me. Of course. Now, let's ensure everyone watching the webinar is on the same page as we get started. Can you please talk about what ADOS is, or isn't for that matter, and where things stand now with vehicles repair shops will be seeing? Well, sure, and that's a great place to start. You know, as you said, I, I talk to a lot of groups, and when I mention the term ADOS, a lot of people really don't understand exactly what I'm talking about or have or haven't heard of it, um, and that's because this is kind of an industry-contrived term, as you mentioned, that, uh, that encapsulates a lot of features that people actually have heard about. So when I talk to them about, have you heard about blind spot monitoring or adaptive cruise control or the other things that you see on your screen, uh, that's where they, they become more familiar with it, right? And so, um, and, and these dates that I have up here just talk about, you know, this, while a lot of times we tend to think of this as an emerging technology and something that we really haven't seen before, there's a good chance that your shop has seen some of these things and these are the dates that they actually started showing up on vehicles. Of course, they originally started out on the higher end, low volume vehicles, but you know, probably starting about 2014, they've become pretty mainstream, and that continues to proliferate. Um, you know, when and when we look at reports from people like uh, IHS Market, uh, they show that these advanced uh, driver assist systems are just going to continue to grow, and you know, one of the reasons that that's really happening is that it gives us the promise of, you, you hear a lot of buzz in the market today about the self-driving vehicle. And the, the ADOS components, the, the sensors, the radars, the things that make it up, are what kind of makes that possible. Um, and as, as you look at this chart, again provided by IHS Market, um, it shows that the self-driving vehicle should be here around 2025. I can tell you there's a lot of debate about that date right now because there's a lot that goes in there that could be a a seminar unto itself, but they're already measuring uh, real tangible benefits of the ADOS components uh, as far as accident avoidance and actual um, uh, fatalities due to accidents uh, that we're already seeing these address and, and help. So while the future of autonomous vehicles, you know, I, I, it'll, it'll happen. I'm not quite sure it's going to happen in the time frame laid out here. Uh, the ADOS components are certainly here to stay. Then before we get too far into what technicians and shops nationwide will be seeing in the, near, in the future, there is a lot of new technology that they are seeing now or will be seeing in the very near term. Following up on the what and where when it comes to ADOS, let's nail down the importance of serving these systems the right way the first time. We push technicians to do the job right the first time, but why is that even more important with these systems? Well, that's a great question. So when you think about ADOS, and I mentioned it was kind of this ecosystem of cameras and sensors, there's, there's a medium and low range radar, there's high, uh, high end radar, there's uh, laser assisted radar, there's just a, a whole system of sensors that gives the vehicle 
a self-awareness that it's never really had before. And, you know, but that self-awareness is programmed, right? So if you looked at this uh, picture that's on your screen right now, you'll see, I'll just use that left mirror as an example, and you see the surround view. That gray cone is what that mirror actually is capable of seeing uh, from that side. And it knows, due to its calibration and programming, that that's what it is actually looking at. So if I was to place an object to the, uh, like approaching the driver's door, it would see that. But if the image was canted, say, four or five degrees to the, to the left, it would still see that image, but because of where the image was in its field of view, it would think the image was maybe three feet to the left of where it, where it actually is because its programming says that's where it has to be. So you can imagine uh, how it could start misinterpreting and, uh, and taking the wrong countermeasures, the wrong alerts to the driver um, in that vehicle if that should happen. You know, another example I use a lot is if you look at the front of that vehicle, there's a, there's a dark uh, cone that kind of extends out that says adaptive cruise control. And, and that's the long range radar that's really looking ahead of the driver to see when it's approaching another car in the same lane and is going to overtake it so that it can adjust the cruise control to maintain a safe distance. Well, that device, that front camera or front radar is just a black box mounted behind the grill somewhere. And so if you think about that being off by just a couple of degrees, what you should be seeing now on your screen are these uh, kind of flashing dotted lines. And that just shows like a two degree uh, offset of that radar. And, and you start seeing that, that it starts looking to the left. And you might say, well, in the distance that I'm showing here, it may or may not make much difference. But if you you know, push that out 90 feet, um, you'd be looking in the oncoming lane. And so what happens is the radar would see an oncoming car on a two-lane highway as a car that you were overtaking and potentially apply the, the braking system pretty radically to try to avoid what it perceives as a collision, when in fact the, the other vehicle is, exa is exactly where it's supposed to be. So, you know, things like that, we're, we're obviously with these, with these ADOS systems, we're going to have the normal repairs as they start failing, you know, over time. They've been pretty reliable so far, but let's face it, mirrors get knocked off of the sides of cars. And, you know, even if you uh, have to replace not a, 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 a ADOS-related component, but let's just say you're going to replace a radiator on this car. To get at that radi radiator, you may have to pull that little black box out to get to a hose or to a clamp, and you put it back on and you do it correctly, but just the action of taking it off and reinstalling it, um, it may not have screwed down exactly the same, causing a situation like we're talking about right here. Um, another common service that causes these to go out of calibration is just a four-wheel alignment on many of these sensors. If you do a four-wheel alignment on a vehicle, especially if you adjust the rear wheels, which changes the thrust angle at all, uh, you've got to go through some calibration steps. Um, I think it's Audi that if you if you do a four wheel alignment, they claim it's about six hours worth of calibration that needs to be done to make sure that that vehicle is uh, is on the road the way it should be again. So there's a lot to think about, you know, not just the when it breaks, how do I fix it, but also just when I'm servicing the vehicle, I need to be aware of what that vehicle may have on it that I could, you know, inadvertently impact, uh, requiring me to get it calibrated before I put the car back on the road. That makes sense? You know, it really does. And in looking over the information and getting things ready for the webinar, one thing I thought of is, well, this certainly makes sense and looks easy on paper. And I think the key word there is on paper. And I'm sure the technicians and owners everywhere know that it is not this simple. So let's talk challenges. What are these professionals facing now that they're servicing vehicles with this technology? Well, th there are a few challenges, Shannon. I mean, all of our technicians want to do the job right. Um, one of the challenges you have is actually when you do have a vehicle in your shop and you're trying to look up in the repair information that you might have how to calibrate it or how to service it is what to call it. And uh, this chart, we won't go through all these cells, but Basically, these are systems on the uh, left column, and then what each of the uh, OEs, or at least the ones that we've uh, listed here, call that. So 
where we call something uh, automatic emergency braking. That's kind of an industry standard term. Uh, Ford has a marketing term of that, calling it active city stop. Toyota calls it pedestrian detection. Uh, Chevrolet calls it uh, low speed front automatic braking. So you get the picture is that, you know, as a technician, we don't know and, and nor will we ever remember what every OE calls something so that we know how to look it up in our repair information. So that's that's going to be a challenge um, ongoing as these, you know, the engineers design things and the marketing teams all decide what they want to call them to give it the most pizzazz to try to make their car or truck more marketable. Um, the second challenge really is having the proper equipment and space to do the job. Some of these vehicles require targets. Some of them require space. Um, and space in a lot of shops, as you know, is at a premium. Uh, the Toyota Camry, actually, it was interesting to me, requires, they, they want in front of that car, if you look at that measurement one, which is in front of the car, they want almost 33 feet of clear, uncluttered space. And then on the sides of the car, that measurement number two is a 46-foot is a uh, wide breadth that the car kind of sits in the middle of. And they don't put the targets that far away from the car, but these are the areas that they want clear so that the, as you're doing a calibration, you don't inadvertently have the radar or the camera lock onto an object like a post of a two-post lift or a, you know something else that might be in the shop instead of the target that it's supposed to be calibrating to. Um, so, so that can be a challenge. Uh, one company recently did a, a – um, a research project where they claim to cover most makes and models on the road today with all the cameras that might be on it. You actually need, need almost um, almost 3,700 square feet around that vehicle to make that happen. And most shops just don't have that kind of space to uh, to dedicate. And then if you don't have the space to dedicate to this type of service and you're pulling your fixtures and your targets in and out as needed, then you have uh, additional time to set all that up because there's some pretty, some pretty uh, tight measurements that you have to make, and they're using plumb bobs and things like that to make sure that things are as, as square to the vehicle as they need to be to make this uh, calibration work properly. And to compound things worse, um, the floor that that uh, vehicle is sitting on and the space around it, or at least the space between the vehicle and its targeting system, is supposed to be pretty darn flat, like within a half inch of being completely flat. Um, and um, so, again, it's just that there are some challenges there. And then uh, even just understanding if it needs a calibration, uh, there's the challenge. Again, the naming can come into it, but these technologies are growing so fast, Shannon, that some of the technologies need uh, targeting fixtures. Some of the uh, technologies are, are dynamically calibrated, which means you enter a routine into a scan tool or perhaps the, the center stack on the vehicle itself, and then you have to follow a driving routine, which sounds easy, but you usually have to be going over 15 miles an hour for some period of time. And in some cities like Washington, D.C. or L.A. or uh, San Francisco and others, it's almost impossible most of the of, of a typical working day to meet the requirements of that dynamic driving loop. And then, of course, if it's static, which are represented by the gold colors, gold or yellowish colors here, um, then there's usually a specific targeting system that has to be uh, utilized, and those are different for each OE and sometimes even OEs year to year as they switch technologies and things. So it's going to be a little bit of a moving target for a while. And, you know, speaking of targets, just – Here's an example of what some of these targets look like. So you see like uh, even Mercedes there has a Mercedes front and a Mer Mercedes rear two types already because that's, you know, they, they chose one technology from uh, for, for one type and then another technology for another. So sometimes even within brands, you get a target and it may or may not, uh, you know, be applicable to the year that you're working on. So um, pl plenty of challenges, you know, and, and it, it when you're thinking about a shop and a technician, what we really have to sell is time. So this implies that we're going to spend some time researching to make sure we get this car on the road properly um, to, to understand whether it needed a calibration and then how that calibration might be done. Well, that that time is such a great great point. I mean, just because there's so much here for everyone in the shop to pay attention to, from owners to technicians, and so. 
while people will become more proficient in their repairs, this technology is going to continue to evolve. Do you have any insight into how technicians can continue to learn and improve their processes as they approach these repairs, or even information service writers and advisors can help provide? Well, you know, and so we've been working on this for a while here. You know, at Mitchell One, we're, we try to really be conscious about that time spend. And, you know, my first response would be, again, from the diagnostics perspective, is just to make sure that we, you know, don't panic. And, you know, the, the information is there. Sometimes it, sometimes it may take a little bit to look it up and find it, but, you know, We've, we've dealt with new technologies before, and, uh, and this is just another technology. Um, one thing that, that we've done is in our ProDemand product, you might be familiar with, the, with what we call the quick reference bar. This is the area where a technician would come. If they just wanted, they didn't really want to search and look up anything, but they just wanted to know the fluid capacities of the vehicle or the, maybe how to reset the TPMS system or what types of tires it took and, and things like that. Well, we just added um, this thing that we call driver assist ADOS. And that's a quick reference specifically designed to address at least the uh, naming issues and the where do I find it and when do I have to calibrate it type problems that we've been talking about. So if you select that, um, I've got a 2015 Cadillac identified here as the vehicle. And what you see in this table, which uh, starts with a column called components, are other components that we believe to be um, categorized under this ADOS category. So you see um, things in there like uh, the forward-looking radar module, the, the headlight itself, um, lane recognition systems, things like that. And then on the right of those, you see, like, if, if it's a blank space, then that sensor probably does not have any calibration identified with it. It's just a re remove and replace. Um, but if you, for example, perform a wheel alignment, it's telling us you need to, to uh, calibrate or check the calibration on the forward-looking radar module in this car. On the outside view camera, the same thing. If you're going to replace the, the camera, it's not just a, a replace, removal and replace. You actually have to calibrate it as well. And then again, if you're going to perform a wheel alignment. And then the column, columns to the right of that uh, will tell you if that needs special targets. So this car, is um, a lot of it's adaptive, so you don't need the targets, but you have to put it into that mode. And it tells you if you need a scan tool, um, in other words, to you know, with a uh, setting to initialize that uh, calibration process. Now, you notice that features table on the very left, uh, we default to showing you just everything we know about ADOS, but if you were actually doing a diagnosis of a system, let's say that your automated parking system had failed for some reason or wasn't behaving the way they thought it should, you can select that system, and then you notice that table on the right with the components filters down and only shows the objects or the uh, components that are associated and somehow support that automated parking system. So there's a couple ways you can we, – we try to help you get to the content you're looking for. In either case, once you, if you've decided you've done an alignment, let's say, and you want to you calibrate or, or take a look at what we know about that outside view camera, when you click on it, you come up with, to our OneSearch Plus experience, which we, we've had now for a while, and this representation, these kind of these index cards, just talk about all the different types of information that we have about that outside view camera. I've got the after repair info box highlighted, um, because that's where you're going to go if you really want to do the calibration. So just selecting that uh, brings up the calibration procedures, and this is right from the uh, vehicle manufacturer. So this is the same information that a, that a dealership technician would be looking at or, or anybody else. And it goes through exactly what that process looks like and how to do it. Um, we, you know, are, w the reason we like this view is because depending you know, on, the, on what you're really trying to do with the vehicle, the TSBs, the technical bulletins, are going to become very, very important again um, as these uh, new, new emerging technologies uh, get designed, get onto the vehicle, and get released. Inevitably, we find issues with them or things that are, are not behaving as they expected over time. And I think this is going to be an important place for technicians to uh, refer to as they're looking at anything that's out of the ordinary before they spend a lot of time in other diagnostic processes. Uh, of course, we've got our wiring diagrams, which are we've been known for for years, and um, we have all those supporting these systems as well. 
uh, very important because you know our main tool as diagnosticians is the scan tool. Um, but the scan tool is only effective if the data bus is up and running so that it can get information from all these onboard computers that are on the vehicles. And we've already had reports on some of these ADOS vehicles where there is no data available on the, on the, on the bus, and it turns out that one of the modules has gone, has gone defective in a way that has shorted out that data bus or taken it to ground. And in that case, uh, a, a lot of systems can be affected, but B, your diagnostic uh, capabilities are pretty much wiped out until you have identified which module it is um, and just take that module out of the loop to see if your data bus came, comes back so that you can, it's kind of a process of elimination, but that's how you can kind of tell. So these wiring charts are going to be very, very important again. And of course, we've got all the OE uh, test procedures. If you've got a real problem you're trying to diagnose, We've got our, uh, of course, the removal and replace if you uh, actually find something you need to, uh, to uh, R&I. And we even include, um, when you're doing uh, labor jobs or doing the estimators, you mentioned the service ma uh, manager or service writer, is that we've got, we're, we're adding in now the calibration uh, or the time it should take to calibrate a sensor once you've replaced it. So you can make sure that your estimates are accurate and you're accounting for that time. So uh, things like that are, you know, are, are what we're trying to do to, to help the technicians as they service these vehicles. Well, I'm sure that that last feature um, with the components in that estimating guide is a great tool for service advisors, um, considering that this technology is going to impact how everyone in the shop addresses customer vehicle complaints. Um, there's a lot here when it comes to researching and planning the diagnostic process around ADOT systems. Is there anything techs and other professionals really need to keep in mind then as they work to wrap their head around the new and growing technology? Well, you know, I think that, as I said before a little bit, the, the first thing is just not to panic. You know, those of us like myself that are old enough to remember the hype that was around when we, when we had to service our first electronic ignition systems, I remember the electronic boxes being blamed for everything from a tire vibration to a you know, to a, a, an engine that was burning oil. Um, you know, the first computer control systems, the first uh, analog brake systems, the first fuel injection systems, and on and on. Uh, the first time we saw those systems and had to deal with them, you know, there's the, we, we typically service things by experience. We I used to pride myself when I'd pick up a car from the service drive, and by the time I got it into my bay, I felt an ignition skip, or I, I kind of had an idea whether I was going to look at electrical fuel, uh, um, uh, mechanical problems, what it, what, whatever it might be, because I'd had enough experience with all those systems that I kind of knew how to identify them. Um, today, just like when we saw those other systems I referred to, the first, the, the time we get one of those in our bay might be the first time we've seen it, and we call some friends, and they may, may they may not have seen it yet. This stuff is pretty much brand new. So you know, the the idea is we have a, you know, most shops have a good diagnostic process. Don't deviate from that. You know, um, we've tried to give you some reference tools that you can use. Uh, don't panic and start going into the parts replacement mode. Um, you know, we, when we service these, when we got faced with these types of challenges before, we might have had to go back to the books for a while and maybe get get a little more training. Um, but it's the people that panic that just say, "Oh my God, I've never seen this before. It must be this," which this will undoubtedly be the most expensive part they could replace. And then when that doesn't fix it, they just get themselves more and more into a bind, right? Um, but, you know, we have the information available to us, whether it's uh, our product or somebody else's, you know, the, the, the OE repair information is available. Just, you know, stick to your diagnostic plan and don't feel bad about voicing any issues or on a popular community sites, you know. Again, if you have our ProDemand product, we have a community uh, site out there that thousands of technicians interact with every day and that's where they'll say, like, hey, I've got this car and I've got this funky problem. I've never seen it before. And, you know, the, the hope and probability is that while you may have never seen it, somebody may have or, or have some good tips to bring you, get you back in line with a, with a good diagnostic process and, and get, you, get you working again. So, you know, I, I think we've seen these issues before. You know, every time something like this comes up, you'll, you'll hear a certain amount of people say the sky is falling, the aftermarket won't be able to service it. But you know, we, we end up coming through that each and every time, and I'm confident, once again, we can provide the level of support our customers have come to uh, expect from us 
and uh, there's you know tens of thousands of shops out there that uh, do it each and every day and I, I know we'll uh, we'll get through this and it'll just be another service opportunity that we can uh, help keep these cars running the way they're supposed to be. I think you're right. It is a great opportunity. I mean, as long as, to your point, you have the right diagnostic processes in place and you stick with it. I know a number of our technical writers promote that, you know, utilizing a service like ProDemand, that's a great resource because this is a lot of new information for technicians, for service writers, for owners across the country. But it is important to begin understanding ADOS and what is to come as more technology is implemented on vehicles and all of these late model vehicles are going to start appearing in bays. Absolutely. So we, and, you know, I guess I guess even for those that don't want to, you know, take it on and service it, you at least need to make sure that you understand if a service you did, replacing an AC condenser or, or whatever it might be, replacing a mirror or replacing a windshield, if it requires calibration to get it right again, at least advise the customer of that or see if you can't get that done um, somewhere because what you know the worst worst case Shannon is that we send these cars out not right because they they probably won't set a trouble code if it's just off like you said a couple of degrees but you'd, you'd hate to have the knowledge that it wasn't right to be found out you know when the car gets in an accident because one of these systems did not uh, perceive the problem accurately and caused the problem so that's the main thing is whether you're going to actually do the work yourself at least make sure you understand what car you're, what condition the car is when you send it back so that you can make sure that customer is aware of what still needs to be done to wrap it up, right? Oh, of course, absolutely. Just making sure that you're, again, doing the job right the first time and 100% taking care of your customers. Right. So, Well, Ben, I really want to thank you for joining us for this webinar and sharing all of your ADOS knowledge with all of our viewers. And to thank our viewers today, I do want to give you some thanks for watching the webinar and trying to learn more about ADOS and all of this technology that is changing rapidly. We do hope you found it educational and helpful. We thank you for joining us and hope that you have a great rest of the day in your shop.